Thank you, Carolyn. Good. Might be fired. <laughs> Thank you, Carolyn. Good morning and welcome to Calvary Presbyterian Church. Whether you're here in person or watching us online, we are glad you are here. The Capital Improvement is selling beef vegetable soup. If you're interested, there is a sign-up sheet in the welcome table out in the lobby. And uh, Malcolm just told me that there's still some ham loaves left over, if anybody would be interested in those. Uh, if you need any uh, new giving envelopes for 2024, please either email or contact Melissa. Uh, join us for the coffee hour in Dad's grid class after the service. And I was just told today is Ann Sims' 93rd birthday. Congratulations. And now I believe uh, Pastor Dan has some stuff. Well, good morning, church. It is so good to be back. Uh, thanks to Dave for filling in. And uh, I've got a little bit about that in my message today that God he preemptively had me put in there. I guess he knew what was going to happen to me. So uh, thanks for doing that. Hey, we've got a couple of just wonderful things that uh, will take place today. Uh, we're going to actually bring in four new members this morning, new covenant partners. And uh, so I'm going to ask if uh, Jeff Goldtree, uh, Charlie Hartch, wherever Charlie is, he's already left. He's uh, Charlie, uh, if you don't know Charlie, um, Tim Roth and Alcina Marshall, if you'll make your way up forward, if you would. I've just got some, some things I want to present to you and to the church, uh, because this is a really special day, and uh, often uh, it's, it's sort of equated with, um, you know, like a marriage, and in fact, I have some notes on that. So, you know, we're, we're here to celebrate just the formal covenant uh, partnership. Uh, today, we celebrate individuals desiring to be a formal part of our church family. And why does it matter? Well, a covenant is simply a deep commitment to one another, and it is sort of like a marriage. Uh, it solidifies certain expectations that I don't have with someone who just wants to date me. Uh, there's the next level with that, and that's the same with church as well. The Bible's a series of covenants. God made a covenant with Adam. He made a covenant with Noah and Abraham and Moses and the people of Israel. He made a covenant with David, and through Jesus, right before us, we're taking this this morning. This is called what, church? It's the new covenant that Christ is making in his blood. And so the Bible is all through con conveying that there's a deeper level of relationship that we have to have with our God together. And so those are the things that we want to celebrate today. David and Jonathan, um, probably one of the best covenants that we can see peer to peer. It was a deep and abiding love of friendship, and for care for each other, just like an extended family. And that's how we're going to view these four individuals. Our covenant here at Calvary is just very simple. We ask for faithful corporate worship, uh, faithfully gather with God's people to exalt our God, to offer him our sacrifice of praise to encourage each other to walk faithfully as we look to the coming of our great God and King. For faithful service, recognizing and faithfully using our spiritual gifts and passions within the body of Christ here at Calvary or as a representative of Calvary in our community and our world. And then lastly, just faithful giving, faithful contributing financially, if able, uh, to the work and sustenance of the work here at Calvary. Uh, our ministry to that which is within these hallowed walls, to the work we do with our neighbors, our community, and to the work that we do in our world. So just three very simple things, church. Faithful corporate worship, faithful service, and faithful giving. And I say that not only to the four that are up here, but I say it to those who are out there who are covenant members, partners, just as a reminder that that's what you've agreed to as well to be faithful in your corporate worship, to be faithful in your serving, and to be faithful in your giving. So as Jeff and Tim and Charlie and Alcina have desired to become a formal part of our family, I would ask them, do you covenant with us as Calvary partners to faithfully worship with us, to faithfully serve with us, and to faithfully give with us to the work that God has called us to do? If so, would you say, I do? I do. 
I do. Thank you. The covenant that you are making with us is a two-party covenant, which means that there's another covenant response, and that is from those of us who are covenant partners. So as covenant partners towards you, we covenant to provide the best environment for worship, to provide opportunities for service within and without, to be good stewards of that which you give within and without as we serve our Lord and King, our Lord and Savior Jesus. So as covenant partners, will you agree to do these things for your new covenant partners? If so, if you would with me say, we will, we will. Let us commit to do all these things in mutual respect and care and love. And I would also like to just extend an opportunity for anyone out there who's kind of deciding whether they want to be a part of our church family. We would encourage you to come sit down and talk with me. Uh, let's get together and I'll, I'll give you the, the good things that I see that God is doing here at Calvary. And they're just wonderful. And we're so glad that you're all a part of it officially. And what I want to do is just uh, pray over them, if you don't mind, and just ask God to bless them. Oops, Jeff, if I can take, uh, Sarah, if I can take this, please. Thank you. Pray. There you go. Let me pray over you. Father, we love you. Thank you for, um, for Jeff. Thank you for Charlie. Thank you for Alcina. And thank you for Tim. Uh, thank you for our new brothers and sisters in the family here at Calvary. They're, they've been a part of the family of God for years. Uh, but they've chosen this place to call home. And uh, so, Lord, we want to love them well. We want to serve them well. Uh, we want to provide every opportunity for God to do just amazing things in their life. And so we pray over them, Lord. Uh, we ask for an especial anointing this morning to rest upon them, that you would meet whatever needs that they have, whether it's health needs whether it's financial needs, whether it's mental or spiritual needs, Father, whatever it is, we ask that today would be a day where, where a special gifting is laid upon them, Father, just for them saying yes to us. And we just give you thanks for them, for increasing our house, Lord. We give you praise. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, please. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And welcome to the family, folks. We appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome, Jeff. Thanks, Alcina. Appreciate it. Thank you, Brother Tim. You're quite welcome. Hey, make sure that you say hi to these folks. Um, I hope they're all in Bigler Hall afterwards uh, so that uh, you can say hi to them as well. And uh, now we've got another special thing that we want to do this morning as we begin. Um, we want to bring in our new officers uh, for the year. So if you are our newly elected elders or newly elected uh, deacons, if you will make your way forward too, please, so that we can officially bring you in for that. <clears throat> Jeff is uh, one of our new deacons. Uh, Bill is one of our new elders. Uh, Pat is a re-upping -up deacon. <clears throat> uh, Buttons is a new deacon on our team. Sarah is forever on our team. <clears throat> she is our new elder and uh, Brother Dave Swaggart is our new elder as well. And uh, so we thank you for all of you who said yes. And thank you so much for those who went off this year, those who served so faithfully, uh, Mark and Dave and Shirley. Am I missing someone else? Barb, Barb yes, Barb went off too this year. Uh, we're just so thankful for saying yes. We, we've got good teams and uh, we're doing great things for the Lord, and we're so privileged to have these folks. But I want to do some formal uh, ordination via ECO, uh, just to bring you in together. <clears throat> there are numerous things, but I want to read them. They're just a, sort of a, a, a reminder of what we hold together by way of our, our tenets, uh, our beliefs. And um, so I'm just, I'm going to read through those, and... Uh, if you say, uh, if afterwards, when I say, do you believe, just say, we do, if you would, please, and that will help. So the first, do you believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and do you boldly declare Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church? We do. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be the word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit, the unique witness, witness to Jesus Christ and the authority for Christian faith and life, we do. 
Will you receive, adopt, and be bound by the essential tenets of eco that we're stating as a reliable exposition of what Scripture teaches us to do and to believe? And will you be guided by them in your life and ministry? We will. Relying on the Holy Spirit, do you humbly submit to God's call on your life, committing yourself to God's mission and fulfilling your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and guided by our confessions? Will you be governed by Eco's polity and discipline, and will you be accountable to your fellow elders, deacons, and pastors as you lead? We will. Do you promise to be faithful in maintaining the, the truth of the gospel and the peace, unity, and the purity of the church? Do you, uh, will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? And these are for just the elders, uh, will you be a faithful elder watching over the people in their worship, nurture, and service to God? Bill and Sarah. For the deacons, will you be a faithful deacon serving the people, urging uh, concern and directing the people's help uh, to the elders? If so, we will. Thank you. And uh, I think that's it for the, that one. So, um, and now for the response from the congregation. Do we, the covenant partners of this congregation, Accept these who have come forward as elders and deacons chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ according to the word of God and the constitution of ECO. If so, say we will, please. Do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us serving Jesus Christ who alone is head of the church? If so, say we will. Having answered these questions in the affirmative, those to be ordained, um, uh, I'll pray over. And uh, for those who are coming in as L or for deacons, I will lift you up as well and pray for you too. Um, I want to add this before I pray. I've said this maybe every year. I don't know. I think I said it the first year. Do you know what the difference between unction and function is? <clears throat> function is simply someone's ability to do a task. We know that you can do that or we wouldn't have asked you to be here this morning. But we're not asking you to function. We're asking you to have the Holy Spirit's unction on you. To be guided and led by the Holy Spirit in the things that you're gifted at doing so that you can elevate the church to a higher place as we follow Christ. That's what we're asking you to do. I should have said that first before you said yes, but that's why I kept it here towards the end. And that's what we're going to pray over you, that God does that for you. So can I do that for you? Father, we love you. Thank you so for these folks who've come. Thank you for Bill and Sarah for rising up and helping us to shepherd God's people. I pray that you'll give them unique eyes to be able to see where your hand is moving, uh, that they might have vision, Father, for this next year. Uh, so that we might hear another voice uh, speaking into us as a leadership team, so that we can hear and affirm the hearing that you're placing on the rest of us, Lord. And I pray, Father, for uh, the deacons who are coming in. I thank you so much for Jeff and for Pat and for Buttons. And, and I pray for them, Father, that you will give them eyes to see where the, the, the church needs help. Help us as elders to know where people are hurting, uh, where they need fed, where they need some cold water to drink, maybe where they need bandaged. Uh, Father, that's the role of a deacon. It's to, it's to help serve and to help us to have eyes on the flock so that they stay healthy. And so, Lord, as we bring this new additions to our teams in, we just ask that you'll bless them, Father, and that as we see their functionality, as we see their gifts, Lord, we pray that they wouldn't operate in the flesh in those, but Father, that you would give them a Holy Spirit unction, that you would give them an anointing that goes beyond their abilities so that the body of Christ might be elevated and lifted to a higher place as well. For that, Father, we just give you thanks. We bless you, bless these folks, and as we are blessed as the body of Christ for them saying yes, we ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said with me, please. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jeff. Thank you so much, my friend. Bill, thanks, my brother. Thank you, David. Thank you, Miss Pat, for your faithful service. And Miss Buttons, we welcome you to the team. And as always, Miss Sarah, <laughs> we thank you so much, sweetheart. Thanks.
Jeff, I think I'll leave the rest to you. <laughs> Thanks. No, you're good. Father God, we thank you for the gift of our Savior, Jesus Christ, whom I hope is pleased with the work that we do as a church and as individuals. All we have is because of you. You know our innermost thoughts and deeds, and we hope that they are used to honor you and are pleasing to you. We thank you for Dan and Deb who are leading us. We thank you for the deacons and the elders who are leading us. We would ask that our new members become active in this church and help us to help them to know of all the opportunities to do your work that are here. Help those newly elected officers to seek your will for our church and our community. And now help us to remember the Christ child's birth as we begin the journey to his death and resurrection. We serve a living God who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen good morning, good morning. yeah we'll take that what a cool and blessed day this is. I mean, think about it. God woke you up this morning. And he probably fed you. And he brought you here. What a blessing. And then we have the blessing of four new covenant partners. And by the way, we are going to have a reception for them in Bigler Hall after service. So make sure you come for that. Um, we have new leaders in the church that were just ordained and brought in. Uh, we have Pastor Dan back and healthy, back in the pulpit, praise God. And best of all, oh, this gives me chills. We have communion. We have the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who died for your salvation. How cool is that? What a blessing. It ought to bring a smile to everybody's face. Maybe not. <laughs> it's a tough day. So anyhow, count your blessings. It's a new year. It's a new life. So let's stand and let's praise and let's bring all of our happiness and our, to our Lord and Savior. Who tells the sun to rise every morning? Colors the sky with the shades of his glory, wakes us with mercy and love, Jesus does. Who holds the orphan, comforts the widow, cries for injustice, feels every sorrow, carries the pain of his children, Jesus Jesus does. does. So we sing praise to the Father who gave us the Son. Praise to the Spirit who's living in us. When I was a sinner, He saved me from who I was. Because that's what Jesus does. sinner showers his grace over all our mistakes washes us clean with his blood Jesus does who sings the song of sweet forgiveness who stole the keys to hell and the grave who has 
the power to save. Jesus does. feel the world is broken we do do you feel the shadows deepen we do do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that you could see it all made Is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. Is the glory of the Lord to be a light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? Yes. Does the Father truly love us? He does. Does the Spirit move among us? He does. And just Jesus, our Messiah, hold forever those he loves. He does. Does our God intend to dwell again with us? He does. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, 
who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, He has made us a kingdom and priest of God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? Is He worthy? Is He worthy of praise? Is he worthy? Is he worthy? He is. He is. Let's pray together, church. Angels proclaim in heaven that you are worthy, worthy, worthy. You are holy, holy, holy. And so we echo that, God, here on earth. You are worthy, 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 O oh Lord. And you are holy. And like David said earlier, how wonderful it is to know that you are our God and we are your children. And so be exalted as you have been exalted from the very first word in this service all the way to the end. And we just know that you're going to um, speak to us through your word by your Holy Spirit. And we want to grab onto that this morning, Lord, and hold on to that and to live that out. How blessed of a people that we are to say the Lord is our God. And we thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' precious name, everybody said, thank you, church. Kids, you are dismissed to head downstairs. As they run with enthusiasm. Get us out. Pastor Dan's about ready to start. Think you can memorize this one? Ready? Bereshith bara. Oh, I'm sorry. We we're going to do it in Hebrew. No. <laughs> you forgot it on Wednesday night. Let's read it. In English, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What a, what a powerful statement that is. Can I just tell you that? Because the majority of the world doesn't believe that. It's one of the things that Christ followers hold to. We hold to it tightly. Second Peter 3, 8 and 9, if you would, please. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Does that tell you what God's heart is? He is outside of time. He created time. That's what Genesis tells us. But he loves us so much that he works within time. And he moves us patiently along until we come to a place where we recognize that we are sinners before a holy God. And we need him so desperately because there's no way of making that relationship right until God does it. And that's what Christ is. Christ is the answer to that problem, which is we're broken, we're sinful, and we can never make that right with God. But God made it right with us and all God's people said, please. That's why he sent Jesus into the world. 
And uh, that's what we celebrate as we anticipate celebrating communion with each other. P perhaps you uh, were one of the unfortunate ones who received a gift this year where you immediately looked to see if there was a return receipt with it. Do you, you ever, and you get one of those? Uh, Deb, and I, Deb and I received something uh, that we would gladly like to have given back. We got COVID. So uh, that's what happened to us uh, a day after Christmas. Uh, but we're thankful that God got us through the, the Christmas season. And once again, thanks to Dave for in an emergency Saturday morning, uh, jumping up and caring uh, for all of you. I so appreciate it, Dave. I, <clears throat> I've received gifts in the past where I thought, and they really thought that I would like that? And it goes into the, it's the thought that counts file or the white elephant gift box for next year. Church, it's estimated that 13.5% of all gifts will be returned this year. Now, it doesn't sound like a lot, but the National Retailers Association says that equals about $101 billion of retail sales. It also generates over 5 billion pounds of waste. And this has encouraged retailers to be even more strict on returns, and has resulted in exchanges only, or if you've seen it, in-store credits only. They're not going to give you cash back anymore, and all God's people said. I think those days are long gone. Well, at Christmas, we often talk about the great exchange. Jesus exchanging his glory for heaven, uh, in heaven, for the flesh and blood of humanity. But I'd like to talk to you about another exchange this morning. This is actually, uh, this last week was the, the time we, we express uh, what's known in high churches as epiphany. Uh, it's sort of the beginning of the calendric year in Christendom, but um, it's also the, the memorial of the kings from the east coming and presenting church gifts to the Christ child. Uh, he wasn't a baby. I think historically we all know that. Scripturally we know that. Jesus wasn't in the manger when the king showed up. Jesus was in a house by then. So he was probably a toddler, one or two or three years of age before the kings came and presented their gifts. So and in keeping with this idea of, of exchanging gifts and giving uh, those things seem to be pleasant in themselves unless you receive something that doesn't fit or you don't want, and then you're exchanging it for something you do. That's the thought that I want you to think about today because as I think about 20 and 24, as I've been praying through it, and I have a lot of pastor friends who've sort of been feeling the same thing, I, I think 2024 is going to be rough. We've got an election year coming up. And that is not going to be easy, and all God's people said, please. That in itself is going to be some, bring some tumultuousness. And, you know, if you think about the last election as well, it also does something damaging to the church. Because if you're not in agreement on one party over another, then you become at odds with each other. It's sort of like COVID's response. It's like you shut the church down, you don't shut the church down. Well, if you don't shut the church down, then you're not loving people, and the pastors are going, no. This is an essential thing. People need to be in church during COVID because depression is so high. Addiction is ramping up because people are isolated. There's no better place to be than in the church. We'll try to keep it safe. And then you've got believers in Jesus Christ acting like unbelievers toward each other. And that's not what we want. And all God's people said, please. Love needs to abound when those things happen. So what I'm trying to do is give you a foretaste of what I think prophetically is moving our way. And not only is it going to be tumultuous, but it, it's going to give Satan an opportunity for body, the body of Christ to, to get at each other. And we just need to be aware of that, and we need to be... Um, what's the word I want? Shout it out. <laughs> we need to be preemptive about resolving that before it happens. And all God's people said, please. If you know a problem's coming, then you can be aware of it and you can take steps to, to mitigate it. Does that make sense, church? 
That's what I'm after. I want you to know that something may be coming, and so let's mitigate it. Let's figure out how to minimize the damage, love each other, care for each other, and that's what I'm after. And part of that is just understanding the world that we live in, and that's going to be my exchange conversation with you this morning. Because the greatest exchange uh, that's happening every day is that our world is exchanging God. You ever thought about that? Uh, the gospel's been given, and they hold it in their hands, and the world says what? Did you really think I'd like that? <laughs> you know, I know you dressed that up really nice, and it's got a bow, but that's not something I want. Can I exchange that for something else? And that's what they do. That's what the world does. The world exchanges God for something else every single day. And we all do that too, by the way. I'm not going to point our finger at the world without pointing some at us. Every single day, as a follower of Jesus, I have a tendency to exchange God for something else in my life, and that's called sin. Does that make sense, church? That's what I do. Whatever it is, it's saying to God, I don't think I want you in my life in that area because I want to pursue this. This seems to give me more pleasure. This seems to, to, to uh, help me to navigate life more efficiently or more immediately because you just seem to be taking way too much time to get this figured out. So I'm going to run over here and I'm going to get my fix I'm going to run over here, and I'm going to pursue my passion. I'm going to do whatever I need to do. In church, that's what we're doing, even as followers of Jesus. We may not say it. It's what we call in theology practical atheism. It's practical atheism. Uh, theoretical atheism says, I don't believe God exists. That's theoretical atheism. I'm not a theoretical atheist. I'll talk to you about that when I jump into my sermon, which I've not even started yet, Tim. <clears throat> practical atheism is this it's living like there is no God it's saying in this area of my life I don't think God will notice I don't think God cares I don't think God pays attention that's practical atheism and we all suffer from it because we're followers of Jesus who have not been fully redeemed and that's what we have to get after a little bit today. So as I talk about the great exchange, and I talk about something a little bit more on the world focus, I want you as a follower of Jesus to try to figure out how to assimilate that and how to apply that to yourself. Um, I've got some points at the end, but as we move through, I want you to think, oh my goodness, you know, that, that's me. And I need to care for that today, especially as I come to the table of the Lord. I'm going to deal with that today as I begin my new year. So I want you to look with me, please, at Romans chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 beginning. We're going to go down to verse 25. It's a very familiar passage, but I want you to see it because this is where the exchange is noted um, in a very specific passage given by Paul. So if you would, please, if you'll read the, the yellow uh, when I get to it as help to me. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men. By the way, I just read a psalm the other day that says that the wrath of God is constantly being revealed. And I'm going to tell you what that means, by the way, because you may not understand that, uh, and we'll get to that as well. The wrath of God is being revealed from the heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who do what, church? So the fact is, up front, church, is this. Everybody knows that there is a God. You can argue with me, you can disagree with me, but I'll fight you right back on it. Actually, the scriptures will. Everyone knows that there's a God. But what they do is what? I don't want to believe there's a God. I don't want to have to deal with a God. I don't want to. So they suppress it. They push it down. They suppress the truth by their wickedness since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. 
I mentioned this in speaking about Pilate and Jesus a number of weeks ago. When Pilate said to Jesus at his trial, what is truth? Do you remember that? Pilate wasn't suggesting that truth was unknowable, but he was suggesting this, and it's even more profound today. Pilate was saying, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I know what you're saying is true, but what I want to tell you is this, it doesn't matter. I don't care. Now, how do you argue against that? See, that's the difficulty of our world. It's that they do know God, and they don't care. They're suppressing truth. And so we say, but it it does matter. And they say, no, it doesn't. Yes, but it's true. It doesn't matter. We're going to live our life the way that we want to live it. Even though we know it's a lie, we're still going to pursue it because it makes us feel good. Because we don't have to deal with the stuff going on in in ourselves. Because we don't have to deal with God. We don't have to deal with family members. I don't know what it is. Everything's a sidestep when you do this, by the way. When you deny the truth of who God is, when you deny that he's a moral person who has moral values that we need to live by for our own good, by the way, not to keep things from us, but to bless us, every time we do that, we sidestep God and we sidestep the blessings and we try to pursue things that we want to pursue, that thing are going to bring us joy or happiness or pleasure or whatever it is. And the Bible's very clear. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends thereof lead to death. They lead to death and destruction. And we see it all the time. People pursuing their own path, leaving God out, suppressing what he's teaching so that we can be blessed, and we just watch people self-destruct. And we say, but don't you know? And they say, yeah, we don't care. (laughs) That's a hard one, isn't it? What do we do with stuff like that? Anybody have an answer? We pray. We go before the throne of heaven and we bring them every single day that God would give them wisdom and eyes to see that the journey that they're taking is only going to bring destruction The power of God is so important in this conversation, church, and prayer is so important. So don't leave that out when we're discussing these things. Paul tells um, the, the Roman church that people who are created in the image of God know that there's a creator, they know it, and they suppress it. They push it down because they don't want the truth to get in the way of what they sinfully desire. That's why the wrath of God is already upon them. Look with me at verse 20, if you would, please. For since the creation of the world, from the very beginning, that's why I read Genesis 1 and 1, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, church, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. They're clearly seen, and there's not a single person that's going to stand before God and say, I didn't know. God's going to say, no, you did. You may not have the fullness of it, but you had everything that you needed to take the next step, and you didn't take it. You suppressed it. That's why everyone that stands before God who's going to be judged and sent to eternal damnation is going to be sent there, not because God sent them there, but because they sent themselves there by rejecting who God is and the grace and the mercy and the love and the giftedness that God has given to them. That's why they enter into there. That's why he read 2 Peter. God is not willing that any man should perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of him. That's the heart of God. The heart of man is what? I don't want you. And God says, okay. That's what this whole passage is really about, church. Our world itself is a testimony that a creator, a divine designer exists You see diversity and beauty and function, micro and macro, small and grand. They all testify to the person of God. And Christmas, by the way, was an amazing time to view this with all the lights and the decorations, with all the songs that are sung. Music is a gift from God, church. Do you know that? Do you know that there's a passage in Zephaniah that says that God sings over you? God sings over you. I wonder what God's voice sounds like. But he sings over me. 
What an amazing gift that God gives to us, music. With all the food that's created and consumed, with all the diversity of cultures and traditions that seek to express the holidays, and yet all this is suppressed. It's merely a created social construct to celebrate the cycles of life. That's what the world tells us. We celebrate winter, we celebrate spring, we celebrate summer, we celebrate fall. But where's the God in that? We don't need God. We're just celebrating the cycles. Well, who made the cycles? Who made the seasons? Who creates all the beauty? We know, but we don't care. That's just honest conversation, church. This is a suppressed church. Look at me at verse 21, if you would, please. For although, church, this is important, although they knew God, this is not an ignorance. This is not a, I don't know him. No, no, no. They do know him. Every single person knows him. And they might say, Dan, I don't know that like that. It's like, really, go outside and watch it snow. There's a passage in the scripture that says this. Job says, actually, God says to Job, uh, were you there when I created the snow that falls to the earth? Were you there when I did that? God's saying, I do that, by the way. God gives us snow. He gives us rain. He gives us sun. He makes trees. He gives us oxygen to breathe. He gives us water to drink. And all God's people said, please. Everything that we need to live and to, to, to be healthy and to be blessed comes from God. James says, every good and perfect gift comes from, church, the Father of lights. They come down from heaven. They're, they're, they're his that he bestows upon us. So for anyone to say, no, I don't believe in God, that's it's absurd. It just really is. That's what Paul's talking about. For although they knew God, here's the result, church. Can you read it with me? They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile. That means it becomes worthless. And their foolish hearts become darkened. And now we get to see the difference between those who follow God, who ex accept Christ, and those who don't. It's a difference now between light and between darkness. Humanity, for the most part, did not choose to worship God or give thanks to him for their provision, for their protection, or for his person. And the result was that their thinking became ineffective at navigating life. The light was available, but, but they was, it was rejected for living in darkness. That's why the world doesn't understand our moral stance, by the way, or our views on creation and social issues. It's, and it's also why we can't understand their point of view as well. We're, we're coming at it from two different places, light and dark, and we're, we're never going to understand that. I've, I've had uh, some in-depth conversations with some high-level academics on this because I'm frustrated with this. I'm frustrated with this in academics. That's why I don't teach anymore. So I have professors that I, I have conversations with and I say, I'm not coming back into academics. I'd rather go to Africa and teach pastors who are yearning to know what the scriptures teach rather than to be in the midst of academic settings where I have to prove something that students no longer want to understand. I'm not doing that. I'm not arguing that anymore. Because I don't understand their logic and thinking. Well, Dan, we just need to sit down and have a conversation. Well, that's wonderful. But at the end of the day, they're not going to understand what I am saying because I have the light of God through Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. That is my, my locus of authority. And they're coming from darkness in a world with human understanding and a human perspective. And guess what? We're never going to understand each other. We just never will. So how do we make that work? Prayer, showing them the truth. You know, I love this perspective of evangelically. I'm not responsible for saving anyone, and I'm not responsible for making anyone understand. Guess whose job that is? It's God's. It's the Holy Spirit's. My job is to present the truth and it's the Holy Spirit's job to bring light to darkness and to give them understanding. I have a responsibility to present truth as the best I can to give people understanding about the deep things of God to the best of my ability. That's why I study so much. 
I have a responsibility that I'm going to be held accountable for God in doing that. But at some point, it just becomes light and dark. Does that make sense, church? That's the battle. That's the, that's the, the, that's the point where here's truth. And their response is, truth doesn't, it doesn't matter. Argument's done. I'm not going to waste time on that. Jesus said very eloquently, do not cast your pearls before swine, for they may turn on you and do some horrible damage to you. So be discern, discerning when you're sharing the gospel, when you're sharing truth. Know when to end the argument, church. At some point, no one is going to win. And so ask God to bless them, pray for them, and move on to someone who's ready to listen, who's interested in what the gospel has to say. Uh, that's what Paul is trying to help us to navigate. It's my point as we think through it in the new year. So when you reject the light of God, you reject the divine understanding of the world around you, it matters not much what you learn. You'll always be a fool, always starting from the wrong premise. Look with me at 22 and 23, if you would, please. Although they claimed to be wise, that's self aggrandizement, that's self-claiming, they became what, church? They're fools. And key word for the day. I don't like the gift you've given me. I want to exchange it for something else. So what did they exchange it for? They exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal man and birds and animals and reptiles. There's such sadness in that verse, isn't there, church? It really is. If you start with the premise, there is no God, there's no creator, then evolution or some form of deviant creation theory is all you have left. It's why brilliant men like Dawkins and others come up with bizarre theories like the spark of life, whatever that is, was encased in ice crystals that traveled far away galaxies over billions of years and landed on a blob of, of plasma and after billions of evolutionary created years, we have what's before us. Does that sound absurd to anyone else? But that's what you have to do when you say there is no God. You have to figure out where then did all this stuff come from? It clearly isn't science. It's just bad origin philosophy that's produced by excluding the possibility that there is a being outside of ourselves who created all this and maintains it. Or, as is rushing headlong towards us, we are the result of alien beings. And all God's people said, please. And as a result, primitive man, because he's created to worship something greater than himself, chose to elevate other aspects of creation. Instead of worshiping the creator, now we're beginning to worship creation and the imaginations of our own minds. They began to erect statues to imaginary man-made gods like Zeus and Baal and female fertility goddesses like Ashtoreth and gods that were a combination of man and beast or fish like Horus in Egypt or Dagon of the Philistines. Paul spoke about this to the Galatian churches when he said in chapter 4, uh, verses 8 and 9, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods, but now you know God, or rather that you are known by God, how is it that you're turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? I don't know if you noticed that in the passage. Paul was saying, you're going to worship something. You're going to worship God or you're going to worship another God of some form. Today we have Gaia, the ancestral mother, which ironically was called the giver of gifts. We have the worship of nature. It's why global warming crazies are trying to protect the environment at the cost of protecting people. See, our world is not the problem. 
The problem is you. So in order to protect the world, we need to get rid of all of you who have birth defects, all of those of you who are senior citizens who aren't contributing anymore, anybody in the nursing home, are you following me? Do you know what the state legislator is trying to enact? Do you know what's on the docket this year? A euthanasia bill. The right to kill yourself. It's in our state legislature. Does that make sense, church? I'm on the right to life board, and you know that. I'm on a committee for Ka uh, Fulton Cass. I've been telling the leaders, you need to make this a life issue, not an abortion issue. Because once you start killing off mentally handicapped, uh, um, terminally ill, elderly people, guess who's next? If you don't know your history, you need to read World War II and know what Hitler did to people. Because guess who he killed first in the gas chambers? Mentally ill, Elderly, handicapped, and then he went after who? Jews, gypsies, Romas, political descenders. Oh, ouch. So that's, we have to keep our eye on this stuff, church, because that's what our world is navigating. We worship the creation so much that we need to kill off at least half of the population so that we'll have enough resources for everybody. That's a lie, by the way. There's enough resources in our world to care for everybody and more. Does that make sense? It's sin that keeps us from caring for people. That's what happens. God has provided more than enough for us to take care of each other if we're just good stewards and we take care of each other. Let me take you to 1 and 24 as we move through. Next verse, if you would, Tim, please. Um, therefore, God did what? See, this is what I want to talk to you about when it comes to the wrath of God. Sometimes we think of the wrath of God like Zeus. He's got a lightning bolt up in the heavens, and as soon as we sin, as soon as we fall, he does what? He throws that thing at us, and he zaps us. He hits us. You know, he wants to give us a good divine spanking. I got news for you. The majority of the ways that God disciplines us, the way that he shows us his wrath is he does what? Okay. If you want to do that, I'm trying to prevent you from that. I'm trying to prevent you from hurting yourself and going in a way that's going to be very, very difficult for you. I'm trying to navigate. I know you think I'm a bad guy right now, but I love you and I want to care for you and I want to give you all the assistance you can so that you can have a blessed, good life. That's my heart. If you don't want that, if you keep pushing my hands back, at some point, I'm just going to do what, church? Have at it. And this is the irony of this, because I've seen this happen more and more as a counselor when I used to be in the past. Life would get so messed up and so destructive, and the next thing they would do would be what? Who are they blaming? <laughs> They're blaming the God that they didn't want to have anything to do with. That's the complicated thing about this relationship with God. We want to do what we want to do. And, but when life gets difficult and when things get messy, we want somebody to blame besides ourselves. And God is a convenient whipping boy for that. And God's like, sorry, not taking the blame on that. You're the one that had the hands on the steering wheel. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. When I teach this passage, uh, there, there's a lot of misunderstanding about that verse, but it's actually very simple. 
so what they're trying to do is say, I don't understand the exchange of God, the God giving them over, but then where does the sexual impurity come? Why did God bring that up? Why not drunkenness? Why not uh, greed? Why, why did he pick up that specific sin? It's very simple because a relationship with God is a relationship. It's not a religion, and all God's people said, please. And he wants the deepest, most intimate relationship with you that he can have. That's why in Ephesians 5, he talks about Jesus' relationship with the church, and he uses what example? Marriage. The closest intimate relationship that God designed, a husband and a wife, the way that they love each other deeply and intimately. And he says, yeah, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about how much God desires to have an intimate relationship with you, to, lo to love you so deeply and to have you love him so deeply that there's nothing between you. That's what I'm after. And so God says, when people push me away, the natural thing, because I've created in them to, to do this, is to do what yet? If they can't have an intimate relationship with me, then they're going to seek what, church? They're going to seek an intimate relationship with someone else and not in a godly way. And that's where fornication comes, having sex out of marriage. It's where adultery happens, sex within marriage to someone that you're not married to. It's where transgenderism and all the other, other issues come into play. It's God saying, hands off, do what you want but you're still created in my image and you're still going to desire things that I've placed within you that are not going to be removed. You're going to have a desire to worship something and you're going to desire to have an intimate relationship with me. If you think about this, this is, this is the Samaritan woman at the well. When Jesus shows up and he wants a drink and he's got this divine plan for this woman and she shows up at the well and she's navigating this. What are you asking me for a drink for? You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan. Men don't talk to women. And Jesus is saying, yeah, but you would have gotten water at about 5 or 6 this morning, not at noon. Why are you coming at noon? Oh, I get it. Because you're an, an outcast from your community. And he says to her, go and call your husband. Remember that? And she says what? I don't have a husband. And he goes, yeah, you're right. You've had five husbands, and the guy you're with is not your husband. You're living with him. What do you think he got after, church? Because every one of us desires what? Intimacy at a deep level. That's what he was going after. He was saying, I know that you want an intimate relationship with someone and you've tried over and over and over and over, and you're still trying, and you still haven't found it. And you know why? Because you're looking for it in the wrong place. It has to start with God. And then all the rest of these relationships will take place in their proper order and in their proper place. That's what he's doing. It's amazing how God helps us with those things. Look at the summation, if you would, in 25, and then I'll give you five points to close. Verse 25, if you would, Tim. Can you read this, please? They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. They, they were willing to live the lie rather than to come into the light and embrace the truth of God so that he could clean things up and so that he could make things right and so that... God's people could be blessed. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and they worshiped and served, created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. And all God's people said, please, amen. I want to give you five things to think about this morning. The first is this, Tim, as we go through. Church, can you read it with me? Truth matters. It does matter. Without it, there's no foundation for anything. And what did Jesus say in his foundational teaching in his Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 6, and 7? 
the, the wise man built his house upon the rocks and the foolish man built his house upon the... And the storms hit which one? Both. The storms hit both of those houses and the only one that stood was that which had its strong foundation. Truth matters. Truth matters. What your foundation is built on, your house is built on, it matters, church. It matters. Jesus said in his high priestly prayer, Father, sanctify them with thy truth. Thy, tr- thy word is truth. So once as we head, again, as we head into 2024, I want to encourage you, be students of the word of God. It will give you the guidance in the midst of world's deceptions. Have a Bible reading plan. If you don't have one, there's tons of them online. You can just go online and find a, a, a daily Bible, Bible reading plan. You can put a Bible app on your phone. If you don't have that, we've got people here that can help you find that. Uh, it'll read it to you. If you're not good at reading, if you don't like it, there's Bible programs that will read the Word of God to you. Brother Sims has one. Don't you have Steve? Find Steve afterwards. He'll, he'll plug you in so that, because I know as we get older, the eyes don't quite work, or maybe you never have been a good reader. No excuse. We live in a digital society. If you've got a phone, you've got the Bible. We'll download the app. We'll have it read a daily Bible reading to you so that the Word of God just keeps getting in you. That's what's going to make a difference for you as you go through 20 and 24. Let me give you another uh, support here. If you do the, what's the devotions out there? I can never remember the name of those things. It's like the Our Daily Breads or the These Days things. That's what it was, Steve. If you read those, don't think that you're doing your devotions with the Lord by reading the devotion. That is not God speaking to you. That's somebody who wrote the devotion speaking to you. That's not what you want. Read the scriptures that are part of the day's readings. Then read the devotion. Get the word of God in you first. Then get the word of man in you because that's how you're going to get fed. Let me give you the second one, if you would, please. Creation is our first and greatest church Our first and greatest witness, Psalm 19 tells us that the heavens are constantly declaring the glory of God. It speaks without words to every person and witnesses to the fact that there is a personal creator to whom I am accountable. Church, every person will stand before God and will have to answer for their faith. We all have faith in something and there's going to be no excuse accepted but only a looming judgment for those who have rejected the true creator God and his son, Jesus Christ. Creation doesn't save you, but it will condemn you. It points you to a creator. And if you're earnestly seeking God, God will provide a way for you to know special revelation, which is either the written word of God or the human word of God, ultimately, which is the person of Jesus Christ. I used to teach systematic theology, and I would always have some freshman kid give me the classic question well what about the the person in the jungle in Africa who doesn't have a a church I said they've got the jungle they've got creation all around them and we know that there are tribal groups that people have discovered and they're worshiping the creator God they're not worshiping trees they're not worshiping rivers they're not worshiping fish They're worshiping the creator God and they have been praying for God to disclose himself in a more deeper way. And guess what God does? Sends them a missionary. Sends them someone to teach them and to tell them about Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So there is no excuse. Romans is very clear on that. Next, if you would, please, Tim. We all do what, church? Yeah, we all worship something. That's the truth of the matter. Atheism is a new philosophy of thought brought about by human arrogance, and it is a lie, by the way. Atheism is simply the worship of of self. That's all it is. If someone says they're an atheist, you know that they are a self-worshipper. They believe they are God. 
But you can dismantle that really quick because if they were God, they would be able to control everything. And we all know we don't control anything, right, church? It's a way to unmask that and to say, you're not God. There is only one God and you are not it. Modern man has just simply sophisticated an old form of worship. See, we don't worship some golden calf set up in our backyard, but we worship gold. We don't worship the fertility goddess Ashtoreth, but we worship sex. We don't worship Baal, but we worship success and power and our careers. We don't worship Bacchus, but we worship leisure and drink and confused sexuality. The Bible is very clear. Worship God and him alone. Worship Christ Jesus and him alone. Fourth, if you would please, God's punishment is often what, church? It's often passive. So if you're sinning and you think you're getting away with it, I got news for you. There's a characteristic of God that you may not like. He's very what? Patient. You ever heard the old sangy saying, give a person enough rope? Sometimes God just lets that rope go a little longer, but at the end of the day, you're still going to get what? You're still going to get hung because sin has consequences, all right? Forgiveness is always there, but sin has consequences, and we need to be mindful of that as we go into the new year as well. And then the next one, please, if you would, Tim. Give God what? Yeah, give him the praise. That's what we're after about. I love 1 Corinthians 6 and 9 because it speaks to me. It, it just reminds me of why I'm coming to take communion today. Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. Do you want me to read on or should we just stop there? That's what some of you were. That's what I was. It's what I still struggle with. But you were washed. You were sanctified you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. And all God's people said, please. Yes, it's what Jesus has done for us. It's why we can come to this place. It's why we can come and worship and study together. And at the end of the day, we just need to give God all the praise. Let us give God praise that he saved us from the wrath through the precious blood of Christ. And the old saying goes as well, on this earth I may never be sinless, but I should sin less <laughs> as I think about what Christ through the Holy Spirit has done. I may wrestle with this broken body and mind, but the Spirit is alive to God and he keeps working with me. I'm heaven bound and I can't wait to see my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So as we begin, two simple words that I've said all last year, and I'll keep saying, perhaps today. Perhaps today, Lord, you'll come and change us to be what we've called to be. I'm not going to mind that exchange in all God's people said, please. I won't return that one, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, let us pray. And then I'm going to ask our worship team to come and prepare our hearts for communion today. Father, thank you for the word of God today. Lord, we, we don't want to exchange you. As followers of Jesus, we have a tendency to do that in areas of our life. Our world constantly does that. We don't want to be that, Lord. We've been given this great gift of Jesus, salvation through him, through his body, through his blood on the cross. He is ready and willing to wipe away everything, every sin that we've committed, past, present, and future, 
Psalm 103 says, as far as the east is from the west, I will remember your sin no more. David said in Psalm 32, blessed is the, is the person, is the man or the woman whose transgression is not accounted to him, whose sin is not before him. Blessed is the person who is forgiven by God. And, and that's really what our, we're preparing our hearts for. But Father, I just want to poke a little bit, not only at my church family, but I poke myself as I've been studying this passage. Lord, I, there's some areas in my life that I have prayed over and over and over again, just like Paul with that demon in his side. There are things that you, for whatever your divine reason, have left in my life. And I don't want them there, Lord. I hate my sin. I hate it with a passion. And yet, as a dog returns to his own vomit, so do I foolishly at times return to that which is sickening. And I don't want to, but for some reason I do. And I'm just asking, Lord, that you'll help. Help that temptation be a little less stronger this year. If you're going to leave it, Father, I pray that your grace would just overwhelm me, that in my weakness you may be made strong, and that I may not focus upon my sin, but I might focus on the strength for Christ to over, help me to overcome it, at least for that moment. And then we'll deal with it the next time it comes around, Lord, and the next time it comes around, Spirit, that's what I'm asking this year for your help. And I pray that for my church family as well. I know that in this world I may not be sinless, but I sure hope I sin less in 2024 and that I'm more holy like God is holy. So help us with that, we pray, as we prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's table, this great gift of reminding ourselves of what Jesus did. We ask in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, please. Amen, thank you. Worship team, would you come? Thank you, Cindy. From wherever you've been, come broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come find your mercy, O oh sinner, come kneel. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burden. Lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. There's hope for the hopeless and all those who strayed. Come sit at the table, come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that endures. Life has no sorrow that heaven can't cure. So lay down your burdens, lay down your
there's joy for the morning. Oh, sinner, be still. Earth has no burns that heaven can't cure. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. A wanderer, come home, you're not too far. Come as you are, come as you are, come as you are. Amen. Thank you. Hey, we just want to take a few moments of silence that you can just have with you and God. If you're not in a relationship with God this morning, if you've never embraced Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, can you just do that today? The Holy Spirit is prompting you. And don't, don't push him back. That's what the world does. It suppresses. Let him in. And I know that might be a frightening thing because you're kind of scared of what he's gonna do. But let me tell you this. When you let Jesus in, um, he loves you so deeply that he's not going to do anything to hurt you. Does that make sense? He won't. He's just going to come and love on you. And then he's going to take you by the hand and he's going to ask the Spirit to kind of start leading you into a better place. And that's what he does. And so if you've never embraced Christ as your Savior, I'm just going to pray a simple prayer. And I want you to pray it with me. I don't care if you pray it out loud. I don't care if you're born again and you want to pray it again. You can do that. But it's not the prayer, by the way. It's your heart before God. And that's what he's after. So I'm just going to pray a simple prayer. And then I'll ask my leaders to come. Father, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I am a broken per person morally, that you have certain rules and laws that you have set forth in this world so that I could be blessed. And I have violated those laws. I have pushed you back because I have wanted to do what I want to do and I really didn't care what you wanted but my life is not in a good place Father and you seem to be the only one who's listening and the only one who can help and I just want to say that today I'm going to receive this gift that has been presented to me probably numerous times it's the gift of your son, Jesus, who came into this world perfect and holy. And he lived this perfect, holy life so that he could be a perfect and holy sacrifice for me. I should have been the one to suffer that cruel cross. I should have been the one that suffered the wrath of your person. But Jesus loved me so much that he gave his life for me and today, I'm gonna stop pushing that gift back. I'm gonna stop exchanging it for something else. And I'm gonna receive that gift today. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I accept his death on the cross and I want him to live his life in me. I don't know what that looks like, Father 
but I'm gonna take that first step and believe and receive him as my Lord and Savior. I just ask now that Jesus would love on me because I'm pretty broken inside and I'm pretty hurting and I feel lost and I just need someone just to stand next to me for a while. So Jesus, if you'll do that, I'm just gonna trust you and allow you to come in and I'm gonna want you to take my hand and I'm gonna start by showing up at the table and have my first supper with you and I'm gonna enjoy for the first time taking your body in my hands and being so thankful for it and taking a cup in my hands and being so grateful that your blood covers me and makes me as white as snow because right now I feel pretty dirty. I feel pretty messy and I know the blood of Jesus is gonna clean me and make me as white as snow. So Lord, thank you for that. Thank you for Jesus. I receive him today in Jesus' name, amen. And for those of us who know Jesus, I pray for that space in us that hasn't been fully given over. And maybe, Father, you're leaving it there so that we stay humble before you like you did with Paul. Would you be gracious with us? Would your grace abound this year? Would the frustration with it be less this year? We want to live for you, Father. We want to please you. May we be reminded of that as well as we take this beautiful supper before us. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, please. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask my elders to come if they would, please. They'll join me at the table. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, the Bible tells us that he took bread and after he gave thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. And he said, this is my body which is broken for you. And after he took the bread, he also took the cup. And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant that I am making with you. As often as you do this, remember my death until I come. There's two things that he wanted us to remember. Remember that the debt has been paid, past but also remember what? He's coming back again to receive us to himself. What a great promise that is. So let us be reminded of that as we take this. Let me pray over the elements. Father, we ask that you would anoint that which we take this morning. Let it be truly the spiritual nourishment in our body as we receive the body and blood of Christ. May we be reminded of the great sacrifice of love that was showed to us as we receive it. And we thank you for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said with me, please. Amen, thank you.
blood of Christ shed for us for forgiveness of sins. Let us take it. Amen. The, the last part of uh, Paul's words in uh, that section was, uh, praise the Lord. Amen. And so we want to do that by singing the doxology together. Can you stand? Let's lift our voices on this, shall we? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And all God's people said, amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord today. Uh, be encouraged. God's going to do some great stuff this year. Um, I think some hard things are coming, but that gives us the opportunity to see God work and all God's people said again, please, amen. Hey, say hi to one another. Come over and grab some coffee. Say hi to our new members today. And uh, class, I'll see you in about 10, 15 minutes, all right? I've never known a woman to drink.